It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. that you've joined us, friends and students of the University of Omaha and the University of Nebraska at Omaha as we reflect in time. Today I want to go back in time to a gentleman who's been a friend of mine, a teacher, but I could pause there and say a friend and a teacher to thousands of people in our University of Omaha, Omaha history. I'm talking about Dr. Frank Gorman, the Dean of our College of Education for numerous years who came to the University back, way back as we think of it now in 1982 as we record this program back in 1948. He came to us from a university, from here we'd call it out east, but there they'd call it probably Middle West. He came from Butler University. Dr. Gorman, I'm glad you could join me. Well, thank you. I'm glad to have a chance to uh, talk with you a while about the days in the University of Omaha. Yeah. <clears throat> and you had many of them, but the ones that began, it's the... interesting, you came along with Dr. Bale. Now, who brought who there? Well, Dr. Bale came and was uh, elected president yes. and asked me after he came if I would like to come out here as he came back to Butler. Oh, were you and a dean there? Were you no, a teacher? What I was, was your capacity the, there? I was head of the Department of Elementary Education. I see. And he said there's an opening there and I'd like to have you go if you weren't interested to go. Go out and take a look at it. So I came here. I, if I remember, I arrived here on March the 5th. It was cold as all get out. I think it was about <laughs> 20 below zero that morning when I came in on the Burlington. Oh, yes, and I you got came off by train, train, of course. Yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, they met me at the train and took me over to the Blackstone Hotel. I think I got here about 4 o'clock and I had a couple of hours sleep, so... <laughs> you recall who met you? <clears throat> or someone from the university well, that you yeah, remember? it was Dr. the former president. I can't call his name. Haynes? Haynes, that's right. And anyway, the uh, streets were so icy that you got into a rut and followed the rut up and down the street. <laughs> now, it was just exactly that way. By afternoon, it had begun to melt. Charlie Hoff then took over. He was the uh, acting uh, vice, he wasn't vice president, but he was the one who was doing most was sort of, of interim the, president. That's almost. right, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, then he took me to Lincoln to meet the State Department officials. He thought I should know them. <clears throat> State Department of Education? Yes. Uh -huh. The uh, Wayne Reed was state superintendent. Familiar old name, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I met some other people in the department there. Then we came back and, and uh, had dinner at uh, uh, down on uh, 13th Street at, uh, what's the name of that place now? It used to be Louis or... Um, oh. oh. I know there's. I can't think I of the name of that place. and some no, of those statues, no, and some of those places. No. But I know <clears> the old restaurant. Yes. I think he's run by his son now. Maybe we'll think of it after a while. Well, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. I just remember. And then I took the train back that night. In the meantime, after coming back from uh, Lincoln, I went over to see Dr. Burke because that apparently an arrangement had been made whereby I was to be head of the, uh, be involved as head of the Department of Elementary Education or Education, mm -hmm. and uh, half time director of curriculum for the Omaha schools. Oh, uh, well, I was uh, interested split between the university yes. and the school yes, system. Yes, half time uh -huh. in each place, uh -huh. and I was interested in that because my training had been in the field of curriculum and educational psychology. What were your first impressions of Harry Burke? We hear so much about him. Well, I liked Harry very much. He was. Uh, direct. I understand and, that. Uh, <laughs> thorough. He knew what he wanted and what he wanted to do. And I always appreciate the fact that after he had died, uh, a ceremony was uh, inclu included in the graduation exercise whereby a uh, honorary degree in, uh, uh, was given to him. And uh, they asked Mrs. Burke 
uh, who should present this uh, to her at the time. And she said that I should do it because Harry regarded me as his very best friend. And well, all. isn't that an honor? Well, uh, Harry didn't Indeed. ever become very uh, close to anybody no. as far as that's concerned. No. But I appreciated that because I, he and I agreed on most of the things he had to uh, his policies and his philosophy of education. He sort of grew up with the growth of this system oh, yes. in Omaha, didn't no he? The big yes. city education, really. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, he... Uh, was a very fair, I think, and very uh, efficient superintendent. And he left a terrific tradition. And of course, the present, uh, the past, the recent uh, superintendent who was there following him learned most of what he, he did under Harry Burke, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he would say himself, he picked up a lot of Harry's uh, philosophy and ideas and carried them forward, plus his own thinking on the matter in the school system. You know, well, I, uh, I worked in that uh, area for five years, but the College of Education enrollment became so big that I had to either decide to go with the curriculum department in Omaha schools and uh, sever my connection with the university or uh, stay with the university and mm -hmm. let someone else uh, take over in the curriculum department. And I had worked in the university for a number of years, in a university, two universities, as a matter of fact, for a number of years. And I rather liked the idea of preparing teachers, so I uh, chose to stay with the university. And thousands of people are happy that you did, Frank. Well, I don't know about that, but I enjoyed my connection with the university. I was dean, <clears throat> I became dean in 1950, the Department of Education was under the, co under the College of Liberal Arts. Uh -huh. with Dean Thompson as head of the uh, college. Before we pick that up, I want to stay back there in 1948 and before. Yes. Because all the years I've known you, and it's been nearly every year since I came to Omaha myself, I think I've noticed a trace of a little drawl in your speech. <laughs> and as some of your former students and our alumni watch this tape, and future historians, they may wonder uh, a little more about the roots of Frank Gorman. So let's go back to wherever you came from and bring us I came out of again. central Missouri. Mm -hmm. I was born near Carrollton, Missouri, which is about 60 miles south, uh, east of Kansas City, and uh, just a little north, as a matter of fact. And then I grew up in uh, Cooper County, Missouri, near Sedalia, which is about halfway across the state yes. from Kansas City, yeah. and graduated from a little high school there in a little town called Otterville. Uh -huh. and, uh, it was rather strange at that time. There were 12 graduates, and all of them went to college. Now, that's you talk about percentages going on to school. That's about it. A hundred percent. hundred percent went to college. <laughs> I don't know what they all finished, but they all entered college. I went to the University of uh, Missouri for the first year, and then at the, at the end of that year... We let the plane go by. Yeah. See, we're on a direct flight line with Air Force uh, right. base down here, and uh, the bases, and they fly over here all the time. I guess we haven't reminded people as they watch this, we're sitting out right on the edge of Frank and his good wife's beautiful yard here in Ralston, Nebraska, on a very nice spring day in 1982, <coughs> after a tremendous rain. Yeah. Now, pick it up again. We're down in Missouri. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, at the end of that year, mm -hmm. I had uh, thought I would... Uh, do some summer work and go back to university, but my father was ill, seriously ill with cancer, and so it behooved me to stay at home. Fortunately, I was able to get a job as a teacher of math and uh, English in the high school. Did you always want to teach, Frank? No, I had no plans to teach. What did you plan I to thought do? I didn't want to. I wanted to become an agricultural engineer. Ah. But uh, I had to... Uh, change my thinking on that, but after I got into teaching, I enjoyed it very much, and I stayed with it. So um, I stayed there for um, that year, mm -hmm. taught in high school, and the next year, the superintendent, uh, who thought I had some possibilities as administrator, suggested that I look around for an administrative job. Already you're starting to administrate. Now remember, I was 18 <laughs> years old and principal of a high school. Now, that is unusual, well, too. Well, I had more <laughs> bravery in my then courage and so forth than I would have now, <laughs> certainly. 
But I got along all right. Now, most of those students were former schoolmates of mine. Yeah. But I got along very well with them. That takes a special uh, well, emphasis to, to manage your own peers. So I went to a little town the name of Strasburg, Missouri, yes. which is south of Kansas City on the Missouri Pacific, uh, east, uh, south of, uh, or east, excuse me, uh, east of Pleasant Hill, uh -huh. just a little town. And there I uh, organized a three-year high school. They had had a two-year, and they wanted a three-year, so I took over. And I still have very close friends with those students. Most, most of them are almost my age, yes. the seniors, or the juniors were. And I still correspond with uh, over, I guess, over half that junior, former junior class. That's and they've remarkable. become very, very able and prominent people around the country. So that's where you had your first real taste of administration yes. and teaching, huh? But I had no problem with that. I got along very well, at least I thought I did. Yeah. So uh, that was in 1921. In 1922, Lena and I were married, uh -huh. and I went back then to Strasburg for one year. And I saw that right, that right away that it was necessary for me to keep going if I was going to advance because... Uh, the people I had known at Warrensburg, where I'd gone for, to summer school, when I found out I was going to be head uh, teaching in the Otterville School, I had to go do some other work in the summer school at Warrensburg and met a lot of fellows my age and women too. So then we went back to mm -hmm. Warrensburg in 22 and stayed through summer and winter till I graduated in 24. And then in 24, I went to a little town by the name of, the name of Golden City, which is in southwest Missouri, east of Lamar, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is Truman's old first yeah, place, you know. Yeah. And I was there for three years. And so I suppose in part I picked up, I'd already had some Missouri flying. <laughs> I, I didn't improve it any by going <laughs> to the southwest Missouri. I suppose, <coughs> excuse me, I suppose. Uh, in 1927, the dean of the college of, at Warrensburg had taken a job as head of the elementary education program at the University of Missouri. And I knew that I had to go on for advanced work, so I wrote to him and asked him if there were any, any opening available for me uh, in the university that I could be pay part of my way. Mm -hmm. He said, Frank, it just so happens that uh, a friend of yours uh, who has been principal of the University of Elementary School is re resigning to take a job as dean of uh, the college at Maryville, and uh, that's open. If you'd like to have it, come over. So I went over. And well, at that time, you see, the, uh, the uh, depression was just, well, it wasn't quite open yet, but it was beginning to develop. So I was there through that whole depression period. Uh, Times were one, tough and the salary twice, was small, Once or I twice, imagine. we weren't sure we were going to be able to be paid, but uh -huh. the local banks uh, made it possible to carry us through until the state legislature should be able to make a, a renewed uh, effort to pay the university. Mm -hmm. Now, the university laboratory school uh, had, two, uh, had an elementary and a secondary section. In that laboratory school, we carried on experiments in education, the various aspects of education. Um, the, um, and I was charge of this, this particular division of it. Mm -hmm. I remember some of the things we tried was introducing typewriting for fourth grade children. And they did beautifully. Mm -hmm. The Royal Typewriter Company furnished the typewriters free to participate in that experiment. In the meantime, too, I... Uh, we had developed a program of uh, uh, remedial reading and t testing. Uh, I was working on my doctorate all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. I had taken my master's in 1928 and then continued on for my doctorate. And uh, it was necessary that we do something about uh, the, the reading situation, experimenting. So I um, went to University of Chicago and took work with uh, Gray, who was a specialist, nationally known specialist in reading, and uh, with Freeman, who was a nationally known specialist in the field of uh, arithmetic. Well, I was interested in those fields, so I took work with them. Then that fall, one fall, then following that, 
I set up the first reading improvement laboratory in a public school. Is that right? Now, what year was this, Frank? And that was 1920, 1930, 30? 34, 35, somewhere along there. I forgot. That's uh -huh. been, been a day or two ago. Darker, <laughs> yeah, darker days of depression, though, right? Still? Yes. Well, hard times were rather hard, yes. weren't they? So, um, in 1941, uh, Milo Vale was looking for someone to head up a reading program at Butler. Mm -hmm. The man he had had left. And uh, he came there looking for someone, and he, I talked with him, and it was just exactly what I'd been looking for. In the meantime, you see, the Depression was on, and the only kinds of jobs that were available were either superintendencies, and I wasn't interested in those at the time, and I wasn't interested in continuing the work in the reading field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I went to Butler as head of the, univer uh, the university program in uh, reading and the head of the Depar Department of Elementary Education. And I was there from 41 to 48. Spent the war years there, uh -huh. you see. And from there, you came to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember very well on what day was it, December the 7th, wasn't it, when yes. the Pearl Harbor was attacked? Yes. Uh, the Bales and we were out driving that afternoon, just looking around because we hadn't either, either one seen much of the city. You were just new to and Indianapolis, yes, weren't you? Yes, I'd gone there in August, and this was in December. Mm -hmm. So we turned the radio on, and there it was. <laughs> Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Yeah. Well, uh, that, uh, of course, was another, another matter. But uh, I must say that Milo Bale had a lot to do with what happened to the efforts at Butler during those war years. We established a uh, university established a program of training for uh, uh, beginning uh, uh, inductees into the Air Force. Yes, so many schools had problems yes, during those years, yes. and you had a program for Air Force people. Yes, uh -huh. and so I taught uh, mathematics to those Air Force fellows uh, as part of the program we conducted, and uh, I remember very well teaching them how to uh, uh, set their their planes, uh, use a little gadget to determine how they fly out so far and then what direction to take to come back mm -hmm. in order to adjust their navigating uh, uh, machinery you see for getting around. So we had a lot of fun with that through, through those years. They turned the Butler Field House into a, um, a, a, a living quarters for I've forgotten how many hundred of those young fellows had come in there. Uh, and of course they'd come and stay so many weeks yes. and then the next group would come. And so you had so a sizable on. group of service oh, people oh, in and out. Oh yes. And I imagine that, that helped sustain the oh, university. Oh yes it did. Because it you important. lost a lot of your young people. Yeah. So um, we had uh, quite a program there. So you were involved both in administration and in teaching all those years oh, at yes. Butler. Yes. In fact, <coughs> you had your finger in teaching through all your years, really, regardless of how you were administrating, right? Oh, yes. I, well, I don't know. had never been a time that I wasn't teaching one yeah. class when I was dean here. Now, uh, I think in our discussion so far, we've gone through the history, the interesting history of your life, your marriage, and your days in Missouri, and over in Indiana. And then, uh, in 1948, you came to us. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not easy. It's a long time ago, Frank. But uh, do you recall the campus? What was it like when you first saw it? Well, see, about the only thing that was there was the uh, big, big building, big um, University of Omaha building, mm -hmm. the main building. The administration building with the cupola, that, that the landmark it, yes. was there. And quite uh, new, too, wasn't there it? There was a Quonset hut behind it, which they would guess the women still use in part of their physical education. And the uh, field house was just being built, I think, if I remember correctly. They were building the field house in the stadium now, huh? They told me, Dean Thompson did at the time, that they floated a bond issue to build a physical education complex. And believe it or not, Inflation was so fast and so high that all they got out of the money that they intended to use to build a whole complex, somewhat like they have today, all they got out of was that field house we had for so long there. And we need to pause now as I, on that note of inflation. As we're interrupted there for a change of electronics and other tape, uh, we might share with our friends who are watching us that it got kind of warm and it was suggested we take our coats <laughs> off, and so we did. But we keep at it, and we're at an interesting period now back in your life at the university when the, 
the county superintendent, I imagine the Douglas County superintendent, yeah. mm -hmm. asked you to set up a program. Yes. He said that the University of Nebraska didn't have anything that was de designed especially for county superintendents. Well, there is a difference between the administrative activities and responsibilities of a county superintendent and of a local superintendent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's been in the education field very long soon finds that out. So I said, yes, we can do that. So uh, I said, what about a summer program, a short a work, uh, a sh workshop? Well, that'd be fine. Well, I didn't know how many would come, so I circulated a little note around the area from, from western Iowa and Nebraska and on into Kansas and South Dakota because I didn't know who to get. You know, we had people from five states here. We had over 70 people. Is that, what year was this, Frank? I don't about know what year. It was about 40, 54 or 5, somewhere mid -50s. around Mid-50s. Yes. They were really hungry for this kind oh, of yes. education. Uh, Ann Campbell, who's Nebraska State Superintendent of Schools, was in that class. Is that was right? in that group, that workshop. These were people who were in the superintending area that needed in help? In the county superintendents, mm -hmm. the area. Well, I mean, well, they needed help, but they wanted contact yeah. with other county superintendents to see what was going on yeah. and so on, and yeah. many of them did. Of course, I hope they learned something. I brought two people in from, from Washington, D.C., who were specialists in the field of rural education, and uh, had them to, to lead the program. So that I guess in part what attracted the people to come. We ran that for two, three years, and then, well, naturally things changed, and so we had to uh, do something else. Mm -hmm. You so, were constantly almost starting new and innovative, different programs for different special demands, oh, weren't yes. you? Yeah, well, sure, that's what the college is for, yeah, isn't it, basically? Yeah. So that's what we tried to do. And uh, it also added to our program many ways because when those people came here they found out what we were doing in other areas and they were able to support us and recommend us for other programs. Now as you begin... I established a very close relationship with, with the education, uh, state education department in Des Moines through those programs. Mm -hmm. I remember one time when Dean, uh, uh, what's his name, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts now, Dean... Uh, well, Dean Newton, now you're thinking Newton. of Dean Thompson. No, no, I'm talking about Dean you're Newton. All right, now. our current Dean when he was 1982. In the, when he was in the, in the psychology department, yes. went with me to Des Moines to talk to the people in, in the State Department of Education relative to what we should do in preparing people who were going out into schools as school psychologists. Mm -hmm. And he visited with them, and I visited with them, and they allowed us at the university to establish that program of preparing teachers or preparing school psychologists. This was still in the period when we were drawing heavily on oh. students from western and southwestern oh, yeah, Iowa. Yes, because, uh, well, it was convenient for them, mm -hmm. and the fees weren't so tremendously high then as compared to today. Yes. So we drew a good many people. Now, well, of course, Nebraska had its own department and uh, at Lincoln, so yeah. it didn't uh, create such a problem for them. But in Iowa, the they people wanted to prepare here, but they didn't want to go clear over to the University of Iowa to do it, so they allowed us to do that. Convenience dictated yes. they might I come here. That, I remember that very well, that trip to Des Moines with uh, Newton, and he was quite eager and, and to participate, and things worked out very well. Well, now as you describe the program, it's really grown. Oh, from a right. couple of teachers in a department to a yeah. sizable college yeah. in a very many, few years. How many are there now, but there were 75 at least when I, when I left. What were some of the programs that seemed to grow the fastest? You talk, we talk about elementary, and then you added secondary emphasis, didn't you? Sort of well, in that pattern. See, the secondary was along <coughs> with the elementary. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the area that grew the fastest was the special education area, yeah. which, yeah. of course, was new around the country, and uh, a lot of uh, people were concerned to get into that and do something with it. And of course, I taught a course in uh, introduction to special education. And uh, a lot of the students around that field today, the older ones, the supervisors, were students of mine over at the university. I, because I was interested, I was interested in it. When I was in the, was principal at the University of Elmer School at Missouri, I was interested in special education and in testing because my field was educational psychology and educational testing. So I got involved with that along with the reading and I did some uh, bedside teaching at the University Hospital for children who came in there and had to miss their school and so forth, and I helped with that. Then when I went to Butler, as I said, I continued my contact with those people there, and they have a big program in Indianapolis, or used to have, in various aspects of special education, so it was logical for me to pick it up here since Don Warner was interested and others were interested, so uh, continued on. But except for the larger systems, 
it was a long time of coming, it really wasn't, oh, in yes, terms of yes. education for those <coughs> with special handicaps yes, yes. of all kinds. I would say that uh, uh, that the Omaha school system had one of the best special education programs in the country. A lot of school systems talked about it, but under Don, under Don Warner's direction, they did something about it, which was an <laughs> important thing. Now, we've talked about programs, and maybe we'll come back to them, but I think through all of these years, from 48 until 1970, when you finally re really retired, uh, you touched so many lives as a teacher and as administrator, and I imagine there are many pleasant memories of people, for example. Oh, yes. And I remember when you were talking about first coming to the university even to be interviewed, one of the first people you visited with was Charlie Hoff, yeah. Dr. Burke, <coughs> who are yeah. just memories to yeah. a number of people. And I imagine along with them, and them included, if you want to talk about them small, there are lots of people that stand out in your memory. Pick a few of them and talk a bit about them. Maybe there's some stories, some things that really remind you of them as you go through life now in retirement. Well, there are a number, yes, there are a number of people who stand out as having had something to do with this. Charlie Hopp, of course, was very, very cooperative and very easy to improve this. He saw the possibilities, I think, uh, but better than anyone else around the university mm -hmm. at the time because he had visited around and knew what was going on. And I met uh, a lot of people through him um, who stood out in the field. Uh, I can't say locally who were um, especially outstanding, but uh, I would say that uh, there were a number of the supervisors. One person, of course, I remember very well was Mrs. O'Brien. She worked with me in the curriculum department. Oh, yeah. And then later became principal of one of the elementary schools because she, when, when uh, Craig Fullerton came, when she um, moved over to a principalship, which she had had before she went into that department. And she was quite knowing, knowledgeable of the field and uh, uh, very able in helping with it. Um, the uh, other people, uh, I can't recall now exactly uh, who they were. Well, some of the deans and some of the other administrators. I remember you mentioned Dr. Thompson a while ago. Well, he, he was he was very cooperative, obviously, and, uh, and Dean Lucas, of mm -hmm. course, uh, he wasn't in position to um, help a great deal because he was in total totally different uh, area. Um, um, I can't think now who would. Uh, Francis Hurst yes. was interested Recently in retired. the psychology uh -huh. uh, the field there. The um, English department, um, there were one or two there. Um, Wardle yes. was uh, helpful in promoting the program, uh, although um, uh, Miss um, Haley Nyholm, who now lives in Council Bluffs and retired, uh, was also in the English department at the time, and a person, a person who was quite enthusiastic when we opened up, when we proposed that we uh, let the academic departments participate, was Stan Trickett, Tri Tri who, who was head of the history department. Yeah. He was quite enthusiastic to participate and take and help in the program of preparing history teachers. It sounds like the program really developed, in part, through a tremendous amount of involvement from other colleges and well, other departments. Well, of course that. That's the way it should go. Yeah. Uh, education is not a thing apart entirely. It uh, it requires that people have some academic background, and one way to do that is to get people who are in the academic field to share their knowledge and their field of learning with the preparation of the teacher. After all, what a teacher teach? Teaches academic fields. Yeah. She doesn't go out and teach education <laughs> no. courses, does she? No. So you see, it's become that kind of thing. So. Uh, uh, another person that I liked very much and had a good deal to do with this was, um, oh, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't call, oh, uh, Charlie Bull. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, he was, of course, over in business, but yeah. he, he was quite cooperative and helpful. Because he was chairman, of, I think he was chairman of the University Curriculum Committee at the time. Uh -huh. He uh, participated. And uh, now around the area, of course, uh, still, um, uh, Jen Greco, Joe, Joe Jen Greco over at the School for the Deaf in yes. Iowa, uh, George Thompson in the Nebraska School for the Deaf, mm -hmm. and um, among the superintendents around the area, I don't recall any particular ones. Of course, uh, at that time, 
I didn't have much contact with him, but I had contact with some of the students who became superintendents. Of course, Jerry, uh, um, <laughs> can't think of his name now here at, at Ralston. Um, It'll come to you. It'll come to me later. I'm get my my memory's getting pretty rusty, as you can see. No, I think you're doing very well remembering people and places and times and things frequently. that have happened. Um, another person who whose uh, help um, was helpful, and of course others were in that, uh, is now Vaughn Phelps, who's been out at the West Side for a long time, and he was uh, supportive of the program in education. Uh, especially in having long students come out to the schools, and uh, so I. Another person who was uh, really quite helpful. I mentioned home economics. You, you know, it's interesting how Marge Killian uh, was helpful, mm -hmm. and she was interested in cooperating. And then, of course. Uh, um, Lita Holly in yeah. business education was eager to promote her program and promote it in the College of Education. And so it's, uh, you know, in all in all, it was a very enjoyable kind of thing. As you reflect here. back on those years and all your many years of teaching and working with people, um, I suppose I might ask you a question, Tori, as the end of this particular tape, mm -hmm. we have about three minutes more. If you were going to define, if that's possible, what you feel makes are some of the qualities of a good teacher, regardless of his or her education? What are some of the basic things involved in becoming a teacher that sort of are a natural quality of life, perhaps? What, what, else, what would you like to share about that? Well, I think the uh, first thing is the teacher, uh, teacher must like children and like to work with children, mm -hmm. must really like them and appreciate them as individuals as well as the fact that they're just children. And I think, too, that, that the good teacher is the person who's concerned to bring the best out of a child, uh, get him to do more than he thinks he can do. And that's the way they grow. Motivate them. Motivate them and assign them things that they think they can't do, but see if they get it done and help them to do it. Mm -hmm. They grow beyond their own understanding of their own capacities. Uh, a good teacher is a person who appreciates the problems of parents and who likes to work with parents, not... Uh, not, uh, shall I say, not afraid to work with parents. Some teachers, I think, are very timid about working with parents, and they shouldn't be. They have a special, especially their own. They should know their own field well enough to be able to stand up for what they, they believe is uh, their responsibility to be and uh, cooperate with parents. They really understand the parents' uh, side of the problem. Many parents, of course, are, are bewildered. They don't understand, and... Uh, Sometimes they're rather belligerent because <laughs> they're not uh, sure of themselves yes. in these matters. So, um, and certainly a teacher needs to know what he's, what he's teaching, he needs to know his field. That goes back to what you were saying yes. earlier about the various disciplines that going, are involved with your college. Yes, and not be afraid to, to, to do things that are different but in, in order to adjust to the needs of the individual child. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have just a strict regime, but see if you can find a way to get to that child, get him to participate and take part. Help the child to believe in himself. And that's the biggest thing that youngsters have to learn, I think, is to believe in themselves and stand up for themselves and hold their heads up, be somebody. But after all, they are, and they ought to recognize mm -hmm. <laughs> they are somebody. And I think you'll find over the country at large that teachers who have done that have always been the ones who have been leaders and have, have been appreciated the most teachers who believed in the children and made the children believe in themselves. Well, I think it's time for us to pause again so we can change the tape on the machine. And I think your picture of a teacher qualifications that are basic to any age were very nice. And we thank you for that, Frank. And